Good morning. <laughs> we get to chatting, and now all of a sudden it's a few seconds past the we look, hour. We look up, and it's <clears throat> 7 a.m. Like, for us, folks. Yep, and we're up. We've had a cup of coffee. I would like an email. Good morning, Allison. I would like an email from anybody who listens live before 7 a.m. your time. Now, that's going to be somebody in Hawaii. Before 7 a.m. Somebody in, I think, like, we have listeners in Russia. How about that? Mm -hmm. And those parts of the listeners in Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand. (laughs) So if you're listening before 7 a.m. in the morning live, Send us an email. Let us know. Russell Walden at gmail.com. That's R U S S E L L W A L D E N. <coughs> Lest I forgot to say, this is Russell Kitty Walden with Father's Heart <laughs> Ministry. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter, from studying from a revelatory perspective. There's something about, look, transactions from heaven happen in a revelatory atmosphere. Amen. That's why there's two things that are very important in in teaching the Word of God. Number one, there there must be an anointing. There has to be an anointing and a revelatory insight. Number two, it has to be applicational. I I have people that I've known for 40 years who have revelation, but they have no sense of of applying what they know. And so they'll get up and teach. And I've heard ministers do this. I've heard ministers that are household names get up and do this. And and they they do have an anointing and they're bringing revelation, but there's absolutely no application uh, to the lives of their listeners. So teaching of the Word of God, the anointing really is a foregone conclusion. It needs to be revelatory and applicational. Today we're continuing our study in Ezekiel chapter 5. Ezekiel gets a haircut. I mean, it it reads like a children's book, but it's nothing of the sort. In this chapter, Ezekiel is instructed to cut his hair and beard, which you got to know, that was a huge deal. Remember when we studied in uh, David's life when he sent elders to a neighboring nation, and they were sent back with their beards cut off Mm -hmm. and their hair cut off and he had them stay shut up and away to hide their shame for months until their beards grew back and their hair grew back and so for God to tell Ezekiel to cut his hair was a really big deal but he's instructed to cut his hair as a prophetic act, and some of the hair is burned, some of it's further cut with a knife, and some of it is cast to the wind. And this all represents the fate of the people of Jerusalem in the aftermath of the Babylonian invasion. And again, as we study this, remember we quoted yesterday that the, every scripture, all scripture is given by God, is profitable, for instruction, correction, that the man or the woman of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Uh, I don't know about you, but I I like to live in a furnished house. (laughs) What would would it be like if you didn't have, some of us have experienced that, you lived in a house, you didn't have furnishings. Uh, It's not very comfortable. And so we need furnishing that our life, we need equipping. And so you ask yourself the question, when you read these verses, How is this furnishing me? How is this equipping me? Then Jesus put it this way. Now you are clean through the word that I've spoken to you. So it's a cleansing agent. I remember one lady that I led to the Lord. There was a message that was taught and she walked walked out, kind of shaking her head. I just don't know what that has, any of that has to do with me. Well, that's like looking at a bar of soap and in your bathroom and your bathtub or your shower and, and saying, I just don't know what any of this has to do with me. <laughs> and uh, a perfect example of that is uh, I used to use a verse of scripture in the, in the uh, Torah to show how nonsensical, as a young pastor, I would use this quote as one of the nonsensical passages of scripture. I say just some things that God says just to mess with us. He said, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Now, in the 1980s, when my parents 
went to Jerusalem, they found out you couldn't buy a hamburger and a sh- or a shake at the same place at that time, whether that's still true or not, because the law said don't boil a kid in its mother's milk, and there was that danger that that might happen. So you got a hamburger in one place, and you got a shake in another place. And so what's the point of all that? And I quoted that for probably 10 years as an example of the inexplicable tenets of God's word that sometimes just made no sense at all. And after 10 years, I was in the middle of that when I suddenly got the revelation of what that meant. And it's one of the most profound understandings that helped me as a pastor. What is a kid? It's a baby goat. Now, goats, you can't turn your back on goats. Goats will eat anything. Uh, goats are always, but, 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 when you got somebody in your life who's every time you're trying to direct them and lead them, but, but, what you're dealing with a goat. You turn your back on them, you never know what they're going to do. You're dealing with a goat. And it says, now, a, a kid is a baby goat. Now, what is the milk? Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. The church is our mother. The word of God is where we desire the sincere milk of the word. That's the milk. Don't take mother's milk and boil a kid in its mother's milk. But isn't that what we've done traditionally in Christian culture? We want to scald the people with the word of God. We want them to smell the sulfur flames of hell. Well, that's doing exactly what the scripture says don't do. Because telling the ancient Israelites not to boil a kid in its mother's milk was a shadow of which that is the substance of what I just said. And so just ask yourself those questions. You need to pose these questions as you're studying the scripture. How does this apply to me? The answer may not come. I went 10 years. (laughs) I mean, God's, (laughs) you know, he probably said, you know, I've I've heard him say that for just about the last time. And then he revealed (laughs) it to me. Please don't tell him. (laughs) And and I hope he was pleased that I was self-correcting. It's like all Mm -hmm. of a sudden it was coming out of my mouth. And oops, I think I understand it now, folks. It's done. And so Ezekiel chapter 5, verses 1 through 17, Ezekiel gets a haircut. And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard, and then take thee balances to weigh and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part of the midst in the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. And thou shalt take a third part and smite it about with a knife, and a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. Talk about prophetic acts again. Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Just a few strands of hair right? tied up in the skirt. <clears throat> Verse 4, Then take of them again and cast them in the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For therefore shall the fire come forth into all the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and and the countries that are round about her. And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations, and my statues more than the countries that that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statues, they have not walked in them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you multiplied more than the nations that are round about you, and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations." Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers. And I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee I will scatter into all the winds. Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely, because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things, and with all thine abominations, therefore I will punish also, I'm sorry, therefore I will also diminish thee, Neither shall mine eye spare, neither will I have any pity. A third part of thee shall die with pestilence, and with the famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. And a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third part to all the winds, and I will draw out a sword after them. 
Thus shall my anger be accomplished, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished my fury in them. Moreover, I will make thee waste and a reproach among the nations that are round about thee in the sight of all that pass by. So it shall be a reproach and a taunt, an instruction and astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee, when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken it. When I shall come upon them the evil arrows of famine, I'm sorry, when I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction, and which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine and evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Now when we study these things, if we're going to go through the Bible, and chapter by chapter, and get our whole Bible back, we cannot ignore one-third of the Bible that is basically of this character in the major and the minor prophets. And you have to understand that for us, remember, Paul said these things happen to them as examples to us on whom the ends of the age have come. What are we seeing in the prophets? We are seeing the natural branch being broken off, <clears throat> and then Paul described, and the wild olive branch of the community of the redeemed, those who've accepted Jesus as Savior, being grafted in. And then handing us this book, one-third of which, none of this applied to us, was not our promise until we accepted Jesus, and one-third of it is a cautionary example of saying, look, I have now constituted you the wild olive branch mm -hmm. of the church, but I want you to remember what happened to the natural olive branch, why they were bro broken off, that this not be reproduced in your life. What that tells you is, listen, Christianity can be rejected as the chalice of God's purpose, just as Judaism was rejected and broken off as the chalice of God's purpose under the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. If he rejected Judaism, and what Paul said in Romans 11, broke it off, what makes us think he would not do the same? And one of the markers of that was a veil of unbelief that Paul described that came upon the Jewish nation, making them particularly resistant to truth. And let me tell you something. I have, I have witnessed. You know, we travel, we minister in a lot of churches. We're, we're exposed to much leadership in the body of Christ. And I have begun to witness a veil of unbelief coming upon Christian leaders where I see this impenetrable pessimism and scorn that basically says, I don't care what you what scripture you want to read to me, I'm going to do things my way and believe my way, and I don't care what you think because I don't believe in you anyway. And a big part of that is how they handle the prophets. And you see how the prophets are handled in our day. They're marginalized, they're scoffed at, they're not taken seriously. There is a great danger. And I've read Romans 11 many times, and I've, I've asked the question, is this a caution or is it prophecy? How did the Judaism, how was it broken off? It was broken off as in the day of Pentecost when God raised up something that would go out and be available to all nations. So for those that are following after Christ at all costs, it could be an outpouring of the Spirit on a magnitude of the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. I believe the Bible prophesies that as the baptism of fire that is yet to be visited upon Amen. the people. We are to gather before the Lord three times in the year at Passover, Salvation, Pentecost, Baptism of the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. Baptism of Fire. We had not got that yet. Come on. But if that comes, and if I'm seeing correctly, it's going to come on the other side of the equation as the breaking off of Christianity as a religious system. That part of Christianity that is has vitality and life completely separate from Christ. God could die, and they're going to keep making the mortgage on the church building. They're going to keep building the family life center. They're going to keep having services. They're going to go right on. God could die, and they're just going to bang the tambourine a little louder. We need to stop and think 
of these things. And, and trust me, for me, I told Kitty when we moved into this ministry, I want us to be so positive. We make Joel Osteen look like a tell of the hun. Uh, and, and I have had, I've had people that, that, that I care about, people that I'm connected with, that because we're going through these passages, they think I've changed my doctrine. But will I pervert what the scripture plainly says in order to maintain the continuity of my message? And then is it a message rooted in the word of God or is it simply a message rooted in the palatability uh, that is found in the spiritual palates of Christian culture? And it's very sobering for me. And trust me, it's a commitment. I read these passages and it's a commitment. Okay, are you going to actually read that today? <laughs> so <laughs> in chapter 5, here is Ezekiel acting out a prophetic act, a demonstration of God's judgments regarding the city of Jerusalem. And he's supposed to cut his hair, divide the hair in thirds. He burns a part. He beats another part with a knife as a sword. A third part he scatters to the wind. Uh, and then he's to take a few hairs and bind them safely in his skirts. Speaking of a remnant, this whole concept of the remnant of God. In verse 5, the application to the city of Jerusalem is made plain by way of explanation. I mean, without, you know, he's, he's they can say, yes, well, that's Babylon. That's what he's going to do to Babylon. No, he says, this is Jerusalem. And that is God dealing with Jerusalem as a shadow of which Hebrews says, we are the Jerusalem which is from above. Mm -hmm. We are the substance of which this is the shadow. And so we should be very sober in considering these things. Jerusalem is in, in uh, verse, uh, what is it? Verse six, verse five. He sees the Father sees Jerusalem as the centerpiece of the nations. I have set her in the midst of the nations. Jerusalem is set at the crossroads of the continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. And this is a city that has been raised up by God as a demonstration to the nations of the earth that God himself is in command of the affairs of men. Verse 6 goes on, however, to level the charge that though Jerusalem was a jeweled city in the hand of God, the inhabitants thereof, in God's estimation, have been more wicked in refusing his judgments and statutes than any of the nations round about her. Now you think about that. You think about all the people groups and all the demographics and all the nations and all the spirits involved and then think about the people of God and think about the natural city of Jerusalem and then pause and in the fear of God consider that it is just a shadow cast by the heavenly Jerusalem of which we are the substance, capable of this level of disobedience. The reason why God sees Jerusalem in this light is why is he being so hard on them? It's like a um, fiddler on the roof. Uh, I can't remember the character's name. Tevia. Tevia. He, he looks up to heaven. He's a Russian peasant. And he looks up to heaven and he says, God, I know we're your chosen people. Sometimes... Couldn't you choose somebody else? <laughs> uh, gallows humor in the light of what we're reading today. Uh, the reason why God looks at Jerusalem in this way is because he blessed and he multiplied the city of Jerusalem and was more directly involved with Jerusalem than he was with other nations. Therefore, the disobedience of the people and the refusal of the people to walk in the statutes of, of statutes of God made their disobedience that much more egregious. Here is the idea of greater accountability introduced in terms of man's relationship with God. It, and it's on a city level. It is one thing to be in darkness and transgress, but another thing to walk in the light of God's favor and then choose to turn the back to his statutes and commands. Lest we consign this concept of accountability to the Old Testament. Well, that's Old Testament, Brother Walden. Uh, don't you know that is that doesn't apply to us today? Second Peter chapter 2, verse 19. A passage that would not fit in most seeker-sensitive models of the church today. 
Peter is saying, while they promised them liberty, they themselves, oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty to what? Liberty has been defined as individualism in our culture. I'm my own gender. I'm my own, I'm my own standard. What's right for me is right for me, and nobody has a right to judge me. While they promise themselves liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For if you may say, well, that's out there in the world, surely not the church. Sure, pick up the religion section of your newspaper, and you'll see something that's been in newspapers since there has been a newspaper in the earth that says, go to the church of your choice today, defining liberty as individualism. If you're going to the church of your choice, you're probably not in the one God wants you to be in. <laughs> For uh, while they promise themselves liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. For instance, the person that is abused as a child grows up to become an abuser. In the 1970s, the church was plowed under by politics and the courts, and so we've become political and litigious, trying to bring about the purposes of God in our generation through the courts and politics of whom you're brought into bondage, of the same are you overcome. For if, <laughs> just just roll back the audio and listen to that again. <laughs> For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome with behaviors and choices and culture contrary to Christ, the latter end is worse than at the beginning greater accountability. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. A commandment delivered not just to old covenant saints, but a commandment delivered to new kings, talking to new covenant saints. Oh, I, I don't have any commands. I just have grace. No, there are commands. Mm -hmm. He's not just Savior, but he's Lord. And of course, we, well, what are they? Well, if I, if, if I told you you would see that as something a man was suggesting. I would rather say to you, you just better know that there are commands and go find out wh what they are and which ones are being highlighted, which ones are fluorescing in the glory around your life and bring yourself into alignment with them. Mm -hmm. But their latter end is worse than at the beginning for it had been better for them to not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment. But it has happened unto them. But he's talking about believers, it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again. Now, the word dog was a euphemism in, in, Jew, in Jew, Jewish culture for a Gentile. And the word Gentile, if you, if you study it, it means one who has turned his back to God. The dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, it is a truth that there is an influence in Christian culture that regards the issue of accountability is something that the world, the world is accountable. We give standing ovations. One day, God's going to come and he's going to deal with the LGBTQ community. One day, God's going to come and he's going to deal with abor the abortionists and the abortion clinics. One day, he's going to come and by that time, we're standing up, standing ovations. Yes! <laughs> Because we have an idea of the world having been imposed upon with a greater accountability than those of Christ in responsibility to walk in obedience before God. Now, let's see, in other words, that we have liberty, which means we're in a position of uh, latitude with God, latitude as defined as though God is not holding you to the exacting standard of accountability that he holds the world to because we're in grace and we're in Christ. Luke 12, Jesus said this. He said, The servant which knew his Lord's will, and every one of us, our servant, is Jesus your Lord. Then he's talking to us. The servant who knew his Lord's will, greater accountability, and prepared not himself the preparation of the gospel. Neither did according to his will, now listen, he's talking about not the great white throne judgment, but the judgment seat of Christ. When believers stand before God, he said he will be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and committed things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. 
So the, basically there's going to be two categories. I wonder if those are the only two categories within the judgment seat of Christ because the goats have already been sent away. So perhaps you and I are going to be in one of two categories, okay? Those of you over here, come right this way. Uh, oh, really? Do we get our crowns now? Well, yes, yes, you're going to get your crowns, but first you're going to be beaten with few stripes. And those of you over here, you rascals, you, you're going to be beaten with many stripes. Now, we don't hear much about that. <laughs> they shall be beaten with few stripes for, listen, here's the issue of accountability. Why is God being so hard on Jerusalem? For whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required, and to men have committed much, of him will he ask the more. Now, many speculations have been made over what is meant at the judgment seat of Christ. There will be strife where many think only reward is given. But let me tell you something. This points to something. I'm not going to say what it is. I don't know. I don't want to think about it, to be frank with you. To make heaven my home, to go up in the rapture or whatever is going to come, and stand before him with the community of the redeemed, and before we can cast our crowns at his feet, some will be beaten with many stripes and some with few. The whole issue is twofold. Notice the accountability. Number one, knowledge. Number two, accountability. Regardless, whatever the lenient ideas that dominate Christian culture today regarding accountability and judgment, it's like one of my mentors said, I used to be an angel till the backbiters chewed my wings off because I stood up and I said one word, authority. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to ignore or escape the implication of these verses. Listen, my, my brother and sister, whatever your thoughts are about grace, liberty, individualism, blessing, reward, there is accountability in God. We are accountable one to another, and we're accountable to God. Accountability includes and implies the idea of recompense, either for good or for evil. And it should give us pause to stop. And I don't think we live in a culture where there exists the capacity to respond to authority to a degree that you could actually say by apostolic doctrine and present truth, this is what that looks like. But I would simply say to you, it looks like something and it is our responsibility as hearers of those that speak these things to find out what that is in our own life. In verse 8, the Lord declares plainly that he is now against the rebellious city of Jerusalem and its idolatrous inhabitants. And again, the idea of cities being judged as well as individuals and nations. Now, we've been taught that when we get to heaven... Uh, so that mom and daddy aren't going to answer for you. No, 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 no. Not only are we going to answer for those that we are responsible for, we're going to answer for our city. So what city has God called you to live in? And does it matter? I think I'd be, <laughs> be praying about now every city, happened, but I'm just going to use this as an example. I'm not picking on my Nashville friends. But in Nashville, what was it I saw in the news the other day that there was a church... A, a, which is actually an, an adult swingers club that was masquerading as a church and it got raided and, and charges leveled, I guess, of prostitution or, or whatever. And so oh, that's terrible. Well, but it's the judgment of God that will one day hold the city accountable. Nashville, I would like Nashville to come forward, please. Uh, when you see your number flashing on the uh, <laughs> light up here, we want Nashville to come forward and receive her judgments or Phoenix, or New York, or Los Angeles. And just put it, I'm just trying to, I'm not trying to pick on any one area, but just make it applicational for us. Jesus spoke in this manner also. Where did Jesus get the idea of judgments upon cities? Matthew 11, 21 through 24, Jesus said, Woe well unto you, Chorazin! Woe well unto you, Kansas City! Woe well unto you, Chicago! For if the mighty works that had been done in you were done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. For I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you, fill in the blank, Miami-Dade. 
For you, you know, well, that's just those biblical cities. No, it's for us as well. And you, Capernaum, little bitty old fishing village, why is he picking on them for? You which are exalted unto heaven, you shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works, now this is Jesus, this is, a, this is the gentle shepherd. Come on. You which are exalted to heaven, you'll be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. In other words, Sodom will not be at the bottom of the heap. There will be other cities. What about ours? In our day, now think about it. Why is Jerusalem being held to such an account? Because of the favor of God upon the city. There have been cities in our day that have seen outpourings of God's spirit in dramatic ways. Los Angeles saw the Azusa Street outpouring of Pentecost that changed the world. Pensacola and Brownsville saw the revival known by the, those names of those cities. Pensacola and Brownsville altered the trajectory of the entire Assemblies of God denomination worldwide. The little town of Smithton, Missouri, saw a revival that had tremendous impact upon the nation. These cities bear a greater accountability before God as the city of Jerusalem and the cities uh, that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 11. So are you prepared to stand judgment in your city? These verses plainly show that we will not only answer for ourselves, but for our cities. Are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? There is no third choice. You are either influencing your city for the gospel or you are part of the darkness encroaching the hearts of the people. This should galvanize you to action. However small the effort might be, there is something each one of us can can and should do to be lights in the world, the city set on a hillside, proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know during the uh, last election cycle, and of course everybody gets all in, in an uproar and stressed out, and, and we put a little sign in our front yard, and our, our corner was very uh, busy intersection in Branson, Missouri, and it said, the sky is not falling, the kingdom is coming. And we got a lot of responses from that. But now that we're in Green Valley, Arizona, we're asking that question. Uh, we, what is our accountability here? If we're going to stand accountable for this city, I want to know what is it that God would require of us to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem, mm -hmm. however small mm -hmm. our part may be. He goes on in verse 11 of our chapter in Ezekiel, speaking of the defiled sanctuary of God in the city of Jerusalem. Now, what is the sanctuary? This is the temple. The scripture tells us that our bodies are the temple. And the church is likewise the house of God where his spirit dwells. We, we can have a long talk about our bodies. About how, how many issues related, how would we handle our bodies differently and would things be different for us physically if we truly lived our lives in the light of the fact that this is not just my body? We say, well, it's my body. No, it's not. It's God's. I think I'd be stopping to think before I handle this body that belongs to God and is his temple before I handled it in certain ways. And I could get real personal there. Uh, whose BMI is it anyway? Uh, whose tattoo is it anyway? Whose blood pressure is it? All of those things that are lifestyle components affecting our health. Oh, you just can't say that. This is my body. No, it's not. It belongs to God. Stop and think about that. And then the, there is the church in the city. Our bodies are the temple. The church is the house of God where his spirit dwells. The temple in Jerusalem Think about it. Now think about the church in the city. The temple in Jerusalem was administered by a unified monolithic priesthood. Can you imagine if you were in the temple in Solomon's time and you went into the temple and all of a sudden there's a priest over there behind this column and he's saying, psst, psst, psst. come here, come here. We're having a great Bible study. We've got a good children's program going on over here and over behind another column, psst, psst. come here, come here. We're, we're, having, we're having a great... 
uh, uh, youth program over here uh, tonight, and then somebody else on another, and everywhere you go, you're being accosted, but all these different priests who are supposed to be a unified monolithic priesthood worshiping the God of the temple in the city of Jerusalem, and they're all trying to pull people in to their thing, that would just be unthinkable to be in the temple of Solomon and see that happen. Yet, the sanctuary of God in our cities carries itself in just this way, dividing itself against itself with dozens of so-called churches in the smallest of our cities, each one vying for one another's members. Throughout the book of Acts and the epistles, we only see the church in the city. And when they divided into units that were smaller than a city, the apostles came out and rebuked them and corrected them vehemently and said, this is not what God wants in dividing up at the house of God. In so doing, let me tell you something. God's opinion of denominations, and that's right, we're not denominational, but non-denominationalism is a division just like everything else. And it's a defilement of the sanctuary of God, just as the Jews defiled it in Ezekiel's day. Because of the transgressions of the people of God, what happens? They're scattered. They're without regress in the midst of a hostile world. This, in a measure, describes Christian culture under siege by secularism today. I, I really, in studying Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I'm coming to believe that Babylon is more than the Catholic Church. It's more than one particular nation. Uh, I think if Babylon is an institution today, it's secularism that is being defined as freedom from religion. Like the scripture says, we'll cast his bands off of us. We're going to do our own thing. Nobody's going to tell us what to do because religion confronts individualism. The culture of the kingdom confronts individualism and secularism worships at the altar of individualism. And it's an encroachment upon our culture trying to live in both worlds and find out what fidelity to Christ looks like. For all the majesty and glory of the vision of God that opens the book of Ezekiel, we are sobered by the implications of the prophecies found in the book. And again, think of this awesome picture of the glory of God, but then it is then what followed after are, is chapter after chapter of very naked correction of God correcting his people. And I've seen so many people, we've sung songs, we've done paintings, we've written books all about this vision, and we've supposed it's spaceships, flying saucers, it's all of this stuff, and, and never paid attention to the voice that spoke out of that glory from which Ezekiel penned these chapters. And we have to remember, listen, this is not just history. This is furnishing for us. This is fuller's soap and refiner's fire for us. And we have to determine what is in our highest and best interest in terms of pondering how best to apply this to our lives. There is an application. Sometimes it may call upon you to make radical change in your life. Other times it might just be adjustment, maybe just an adjustment in your attitude. God told our friend Denise Alsop when she was working for us, one day the Lord said, hey, lose the attitude. <laughs> if I ever heard a word from God uh, for, for uh, us in different times in our life, it's that. Adjusting our thinking, adjusting our fidelities, clarifying our commitment to Christ. But that may involve moving to another city. That may involve a change in relationship to the church you're a part of. That may involve, you're in a, you're in a family situation. Now think about this. This is a guy. Yes, this is Ezekiel. Okay, now this is a guy who has taken and he's cut his hair and he's thrown it around and he set it on fire. Now, you think about your unsaved loved ones. 
He, you know, all of this is dealing with Ezekiel's family. These were his brothers, his sisters. These were people he was related to. What happens at the next family get-together when the unwritten rule is, don't you go talking about your church. Don't you go talking about religion. And all of a sudden, you take out a razor, ladies, with that beautiful hair, or a gentleman, and you take out a razor, and you cut your hair in front of everybody, throw it down on the plate in front of you, set part of it on fire, throw another part over your shoulder, stick some of it in your pocket, and start prophesying to your family members. How badly do you want your loved ones to get straight? Heaven help us. Well, that's for the prophets. But remember, 1 Corinthians 14 says, you may all prophesy. You can all cut off your hair and act like idiots. <laughs> Come on now. You can all do like Isaiah and go naked from the waist down to prove a point. You can all do these. You can all lay on your side. You're not going to work? No. What are you going to do? I'm just going to lay here in front of this frying pan I put on the living room floor. I'm going to lay in front of this, this, this little picture I drew on a brick of, of, of this family and with this frying pan between me and that. And, and uh, I'm going to eat my food cooked with human dung, which is what he was told to do in the beginning. <laughs> Come on now. How badly? How far are you willing to go to be that light set on hillside? Do you just want a little tea light? Or do you want a mercury vapor lamp that's going to burn out the darkness in the uh, people group, whether your family or church that you're a part of. How far are you willing to go? Sobering. So let's step, let's, let's, let's allow this narrative to step off into us today and turn us truly into radical followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we all want John 10.10 10 to step off into this life and life more abundantly. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, let's let this, this, this bundle of prophetic angst and vision and glory to step off into us and detonate us until nobody around us can continue with business as usual till they acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. Kotaba sabarabanda bakaste de shete. Do that in us, O oh God. Yes. Like Evan Roberts of the Welsh Revival cried, Bend us, O oh God. Bend us to your will and save the world. And the entire nation of Wales came to Christ. A nation was changed in a day because of a man named Evan Roberts who prayed thus. Let that be our prayer. My brothers and sisters. Amen.